deals with a controversial subject. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. The viewer is invited to make a judgment based on all available information. Tonight on Sightings, a grisly murder leaves a parapsychologist dead. When they discovered the body, there were no clues. But from beyond the grave, he helped authorities find the killer. Then, if you think the Bermuda Triangle is the world's only deadly vortex, think again. Now what you're dealing with is something that's transient. It happens suddenly and it's gone. We investigate the deadly force that's taken thousands in America's Great Lakes. And what psychic miracle gave this woman the incredible power to accurately predict hundreds of earthquakes. Her track record for quakes that she has reported into me has been 70 or 80 percent. At that point, it started to appear. They had large, dark eyes, claw-like hands. I began sensing and knowing and feeling. I do believe in life after death. I mean, I've been there. We have not scratched the surface of what the mind can do. It's a connection with the unknown. In 1990, psychic Scott Rogo had a horrifying premonition. He saw a man being murdered. The terrifying vision of death haunted his dreams. And most frightening of all was that the murder victim Scott saw was himself. Tragically, it was a premonition that came true. Scott Rogo was internationally recognized as an expert in the paranormal. He was the author of 30 parapsychology books that ranged in subjects from ghosts to premonitions. Ironically, Scott's fatal premonition about his own life would come true. On August 16, 1990, as a peaceful San Fernando Valley, California sleeps, a grisly murder is taking place. World-renowned parapsychologist Scott Rogo is stabbed to death, his throat slashed. Somebody had come to his house, possibly, uh in the evening and stab uh, Mr. Rogo. Tragically, Scott's accurate premonition was to be his last. When they discovered the body, there were no clues. There was the actual murder weapon found with blood, and right by the wall, closest to the body, there was some fingerprints and blood. But that initial evidence did not lead to the killer's identity. Psychics felt the police needed an expert witness, testimony from the dead man himself. I conducted two separate investigations. One was akin to a private investigation. The other was a psychic investigation. Psychic researcher Betty Bandy asked some of the world's top psychics to try to contact Scott. And what they found would send the investigation in an important new direction. Psychic Armand Marcotte believes the murder victim told him to check the fingerprints on a glass left at the murder scene. They both had a drink to calm their nerves after the crime was committed. The darker the men, he went to the bathroom and he forgot to wipe his glass and it was left there. I wrote a detailed report of the information given to me by the psychics because a very clear picture did emerge from the psychic report. They went back to the house and did a thorough search of the bathroom. And that's where they found the glass that tied in the present killer that's in, been convicted and put away since then. That's how they finally came on the path of Mr. Batista. He was convicted of second degree murder and sentenced, uh, I believe it was 15 years to life. My private belief is that Scott has assisted me in collecting information. Is it possible that Scott Rocco is trying to conduct his own murder investigation from the grave? How else could you explain the psychic's insistence that police re-examine the fingerprints on the glass? And many believe Rogo is still trying to reach out to them because there are still many unanswered questions about the case. The most troubling, that a second murderer is still at large. Psychics won't give up until that killer is found. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that there was a second suspect. However, at this time, we don't have any idea of who it may be. We don't know race, age. We have no other information of this person. The fingerprint and blood did not match Mr. Batista, the defendant, nor Mr. Rogo. With police at a virtual standstill, we ask psychic detective Nick Nosorino to examine the murder of Scott Rogo. You seem to be interested in Scott uh, Rogo and he is the person we want to tune into and we want to find out what happened 
and uh, if possible, uh, give you as much information as we, as we can. Nick Nosorino has been a respected psychic investigator for 47 years. He begins a typical murder investigation by visiting the last place the victim was seen alive. Every time I mention his name, I get lots of pain, sharp pain. I don't know whether he's having a heart attack or, or what's going on. Nick's investigation also takes him to several locations frequented by Scott in the days just before his murder. Nick believes this method of investigation will stir up the tremendous psychic energy necessary to make contact with Scott Rogo. He then brings in a team of psychics to investigate the single most important location in the case, the very house in which Scott Rogo was found stabbed to death. We hope to find out how the man died, if possible who killed him or how many people killed him. And then connected with the killing, there's been a killing here. Each psychic surveys the house, attempting to gather psychic energy. Right around my throat is tightening up immediately, and then it's moving down into my chest area. Besides the stabbing, there was an attempt to choke him. I heard gagging. There were three individuals besides the man who was hurt and blood all around. This is definitely a house that has had a lot of energy and it still is filled with different energy. There's a lot of anger associated with that too, and it's a frenetic kind of energy. The psychics then agree to break off into two separate groups, in two separate rooms, to form seance-like triads. And I call upon the energy of Scott Rogo to assist us in any way he can. There's three people involved. Two came in one car, one came in another car. They got in the house. There were two people performing the majority of the violence. In two separate rooms, at almost the same time, the psychics believe they have made contact with Scott Rogo, who is now conducting his own murder investigation from beyond the grave. Their intent when they entered this home was not to kill him. He's screaming. I can't hear what he's screaming, but I can hear him screaming. Things j just got out of hand. One of them short. Five foot six, five foot seven, overweight. Kind of long, wavy, black hair, maybe a little balding on the top. He may be the one who has the tattoo on his arm. Scar, it's a mark on his face. Right below his eye. Tiny, Tiny little mustache. mustache. See a car parked. Bandana on the head, not a hairnet. VWY. Bushy eyebrows. 436. Romano, Romano's the last name. Pacers. Jason, James, Alexander, all those names fit the big one. They're within 100 miles of here. Oh, these are the names of the other guys! According to the psychic team, this is the killer of Scott Rogo. Both triads, independent of each other, provided the same description. The man was about 5'6", five, 5'7", five, round of face, Hispanic, tiny little mustache, black oily wavy hair, with a bandana, long, long police record. He was the one perpetrating most of the violence. This is the man the psychics believe killed Scott Rogo. He is Hispanic, about five foot seven inches tall, 160 pounds in weight, and still living, they believe, in the Southern California area. The sketch and description have been handed over to police for further investigation. The product, psychics believe, of Scott Rogo's ghostly communication about the face behind the bloody handprint. His presence to me was still very strong in that house and hoping that somebody will uncover some aspect of the crime. Police policy prohibits comment on this unsolved case, but we will follow their developments and hope to bring you an update of the Scott Rogo case in the near future. Coming up, the Bermuda Triangle has nothing on these lakes. Now what you're dealing with is something that's transient it happens suddenly, and it's gone. We investigate the deadly force that haunts America's Great Lakes. The Bermuda Triangle may be the most famous vortex of mystery and death in the world, but it's not the only one. The Great Lakes Triangle, right here in the United States, has been almost as deadly. Hundreds of people have vanished in an area which many believe is a gateway to oblivion. There is a force that has survived from folklore to scientific fact. Bizarre anomalies that rival the Bermuda Triangle. A ship, the Edmund Fitzgerald, built to withstand the most violent weather, sinks in less than a minute. A modern jet airliner crashes into Lake Michigan in clear weather. These are only two of the thousands of shipwrecks and plane crashes 
that have plagued the Great Lakes since earliest recorded history. The most dangerous zone is known as the Marsberg Vortex in Lake Ontario, but disappearances routinely occur throughout a larger area known as the Great Lakes Triangle. Marine insurance records show that more than 15,000 shipwrecks, plane crashes, and other mysterious catastrophes over the past 200 years have given the Great Lakes Triangle a deadly reputation, with the highest concentration of unexplained accidents in the world. With uh, Marysburg, what you get is the, exactly the same type of things. You're getting down in around the Bermuda Triangle, disappearing people, disappearing ships, and that. We have found that there is at least one major link between all these crashes and disappearances. The ever-present magnetic fields which wrap the Earth appear to act differently in the Great Lakes Triangle. A compass reading on one day can be totally different the next, making critical navigational systems inoperative. Uh, we found that even using three separate compasses, all the readings being uh, very much similar, that when we plotted that on a chart, uh, we were nowhere near uh, one case, we were a quarter of a mile on shore, and yet we're five miles physically on the boat offshore. Peculiar magnetic forces can spell disaster for a ship or a plane that relies on exact instrument readings. Could strange magnetic forces in the Great Lakes Triangle be enough to throw ships and planes wildly off course and into fatal situations? Some believe that's exactly what caused the 729-foot Edmund Fitzgerald to sink to the bottom of Lake Superior. This state-of-the-art vessel had two independent radar systems thought to be infallible, but they weren't. And route to Cleveland, Ohio, disaster struck. November 10th, 1975, 5 p.m. The Edmund Fitzgerald is fully loaded with iron ore and leaves port. By 6 p.m., the ship is unexpectedly caught in the grips of a severe winter storm just after 7 p.m., the Edmund Fitzgerald, a highly sophisticated modern freighter, has disappeared, with all hands feared lost. The weather was harsh, but the Edmund Fitzgerald was designed to withstand storms like this. The beginning of the end occurred when not one, but both radar systems failed. With low visibility and no working navigational system, the ship was doomed. I do know that they had lost their radar, and they were depending on the Anderson, which was a ship nearby in the storm, the Anderson was doing their seeing for them. It was trying to get the fix on the Fitzgerald with radar and then radio to the Fitz and tell them where they were. One minute, they had a blip on the radar, and the next minute, the blip was gone. They were in communication with the Fitzgerald at 10 minutes after 7. At 20 minutes after 7, they had no sight of her at all. And, uh, Given that 10-minute span and the fact that no distress call was ever sent by the Fitzgerald, uh, that ship going down must have happened no more than a minute. Uh, it just dove, went down, and that was the end of it. So I understand you had him uh, visually and on the radar, and you lost him uh, uh, in both respects. Uh, no, I didn't have him uh, visually. I had him on the radar. He was uh, exactly 10 miles ahead of us. I asked him how he was making out with his problem. Uh, he said he lost those vents and he had a lift and he said he was holding his own. I uh, lost contact after that. In less than one minute, the enormous ship had disappeared. All hands on board died. It was a tragic testimony to the power of a deadly force still feared by all who dare venture there. I think in a lot of people's mind, there is something missing. There's one little fact or something that went wrong or something that happened that maybe we'll never know about. Something mysterious, something unexplained. United Flight 389 inbound from New York to Chicago in 1965. Although flying in clear skies and calm weather, it would suffer the same fate as the Edmund Fitzgerald. The approach was over Lake Michigan. The last uh, altitude that they were cleared to, in which he was supposed to have leveled off and maintained that altitude until cleared lower, was 6,000 feet. But Flight 389 did not level off at 6,000 feet. The aircraft struck the water in a descending attitude. It spread over about 1.6 miles, and it sank in about 250 feet of water. We know there was no mid-air collision. We know there was no structural failure. We know the engines were operating properly. 
everything appeared to be normal up until the uh, aircraft disappeared. Unpredictable magnetic energies that ripple through the entire 100,000 square mile area of the Great Lakes may explain what happened. Now what you're dealing with is something that's transient. It happens suddenly and it's gone. You haven't got any actual scientific measurements. What we know is that there's actually magnetic anomalies in the area. How they could cause these mysterious disappearances, how they could cause the sinking, no one seems to know. Magnetic forces that can kill. Do they exist in the Great Lakes Triangle? Researchers continue to study the bizarre quirk of nature that has taken so many lives. In the past year alone, nearly 35 boats and planes have vanished without a trace. Coming up, what gave this woman the psychic power to accurately predict earthquakes? I just sat there and cried because I knew people were going to die. And I spent the next six hours on the telephone trying to warn people that, that, that a major quake was going to hit Mexico. People who have been near death report many kinds of paranormal experience. After a miraculous recovery, a very special few claim to have new, unexplainable psychic powers, powers they believe were bestowed upon them through a controversial phenomenon known as soul exchange. The soul that is in the body leaves. Another totally different soul comes and the in. The idea of an exchange was explained to her. And if she really wanted to die, that would be fine, but why should she die? Because it was a perfectly yeah, good body. A total of 13 separate sounds that I hear all the time. When the sound changed, an earthquake would happen within 72 hours. I think they are tuning into another dimension of experience that is normally closed off to us. The concept is known as soul exchange, or as the walk-in phenomenon. In a soul exchange, one soul leaves the physical body, and a new soul walks in. Well, a walk-in is a highly developed soul from previous lifetimes who has earned the right, if he wants to, to come into an adult body to complete a project that, that he would like to do. The walk-in, or soul exchange, occurs at a time of personal crisis. Individuals recount feelings of severe physical or emotional pain, even a death wish. After the transformation, they experience profound changes in their lives. I took all the pills in the bottle and drank some of the alcohol. The headache was so bad that my insides ached. All I said was, I want out. I want the pain to stop. The purpose of a soul exchange is always to have uh, a being come into a body that is more highly evolved and it's coming here for the purpose of helping the Earth um, evolve. For a precious few, the supposed soul exchange triggers miraculous new and unexplainable talents. Charlotte King's experience has been remarkable. In uh, December of 76, I overdosed on a combination of Valium and Brandy. But fortunately, I guess I didn't take enough to, to, to give me a fatal overdose, but I was in a real bad state for quite a few hours. And I heard the word um, that the doctor had admitted me and, and uh, that I would have to stay there. And, and I was in kind of a drugged sleep, a very drugged sleep. And um, a few hours later, I all of a sudden became real full of energy, just a burst of energy. Charlotte believes she left the hospital literally a new person, one with an uncanny talent to predict violent seismic activity around the world. She began to hear sounds no one else could hear and had nearly unbearable pains throughout her body. In the, in the um, way that I predict the earthquakes, the way that I forecast the earthquakes, is uh, through the sound and the combination of sound and pain tells me where the earthquake will take place. But her newfound talent was emotionally painful. In 1985, she sensed a quake in Mexico City, but no one would listen. I was working at a computer company in Sacramento in 1985 in September, and um, I began having headaches. And I went to my boss, Paul, and I said, Paul, I've got to go home. He said, why? I said, there's going to be a major earthquake. And he said, where? And I said, Mexico. And he said, there better be. And I went home. And I spent the next six hours on the telephone trying to warn people that, that, that a major quake was going to hit Mexico. Nobody was interested. Nobody cared. And I just sat there and cried because I knew people were going to die. And there was nothing I could do about it. As the sounds and pain persisted, Charlotte got in touch with Christopher Dodge at the Library of Congress. He began tracking her predictions as part of Project Migraine. 
was absolutely understood from the very beginning that Charlotte must call me up before the earthquake and that it must be recorded and it must be witnessed. And of course, I felt sure that those restrictions would uh, thoroughly discourage her from undertaking to do something like that. And in fact, I was hoping that it would, but it didn't. And in rapid sequence, uh, she proceeded to predict uh, major events. I called Chris on the phone and said, Chris, all hell's gonna break loose. I said, um, Mount St. Helens is gonna have a major change within 72 hours. And uh, he picked up the phone and called the Volcano Center and they said, absolutely not, there's no activity. And the next day, Mount St. Helens went on eruption alert. And it, it blew a few days later in April. Over time, I would say that uh, her track record for quakes that she has reported into me has been between seven and eight on a scale of 10, or other, in other words, 70 or 80 percent. And in some cases, with Mount St. Helens, I'd say that she was been, has been 100 percent accurate. Charlotte predicted the recent earthquakes in Southern California and now believes the big one is coming. I think there's a real possibility that there's going to be a lot more activity down there. There's just a whole different feeling to this series of earthquakes, both in Northern and Southern California that have been occurring since April the 23rd. Charlotte believes her amazing predictions are due to a soul exchange. Skeptics doubt that soul exchange exists, but Charlotte's 70% accuracy rate is testimony to the transformation in her life. Thanks for joining us. For Sightings, I'm Tim White. Good night. On the next Sightings, has science learned how to beat death with the latest technology in cryogenics? And would you be willing to be frozen to death to extend your life? Plus, an entire town that claims to be reincarnated. All on the next Sightings. Tomorrow, on the season premiere of Code 3, be there when a daredevil stunt turns to tragedy and a bungee jumper's cord snaps right before your eyes. Code 3, tomorrow, after the season premiere of Cops. And Sunday, get ready for TV history in the making as Rock returns live with no retakes, no second chances, and no telling what will happen. See the season premiere of Rock live Sunday after the classic first episode of In Living Color. Now, stay tuned for an all-new Rachel Gunn.